episode of Cloud Focus Weekly for the second week of August 2010. This episode is titled Cloudy Questions, Easy Answers. Cloud Focus Weekly is sponsored by Arcus, cloud community experts. I'm your host, Jason Atwood, and joining me is the co-host, Justin Ellstein. Hi, Justin. How are you doing? Am I the co-host or your co-host? Uh, today, you're the t- co-host. All right. I'll Next be time, you can be co-host. my co-host, and the time after that, you could be their co-host. All right. So uh, we have a little quick agenda. We're actually doing an early podcast this week because the week filled up before it even got going. So, but that doesn't matter because the cloud news always is happening. Um, so we're going to talk. We're going to talk about three things today. Um, there's a new article called "Why Are 3D TVs and Chatter More Similar Than 3D TVs in Google Wave?" which is a kind of a good follow up from some of the Google Wave stuff that happened last week. Um, then I was surfing around and found this one uh, from – it's called Five Popular Questions on Cloud Computing. It came out of a play, uh, Cloud Camp where they asked all these different people, what's your top five questions? So we'll actually go and answer those. We're not even going to go to the answers that they provided because – yeah, don't really care. We're going to go to the answers that we would provide if they were talking to us. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about nonprofits now they're using clouds. But first, just a quick little update on the podcast. So it's the fifth podcast now. And uh, so we've done a few little changes. Uh, we changed the logo so that you should notice. Hopefully in the next time you upgrade or up, you know, through um, – iTunes or whatever, and we also changed the title, so it is now Cloud Focus Weekly, with a capital F. Um, we just thought since we are actually going to do it weekly, it'll keep us to weekly, uh, and it rolls off the tongue easier. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, nothing like putting it in your title to make you do it weekly. <laughs> it's true. I mean, we were going to do Cloud Focus hourly, but just all the post-production. That's called, that you that's called Twitter. <laughs> that is called Twitter. Speaking – no, let's not do it. So let's talk about the first article. Um, uh, why are 3D TVs and chatter more similar than 3D TVs and Google Wave? Now, this really comes about from – it's a blog post on the Force.com platform. So it comes from Salesforce. Um, and it's basically comparing the difference between, you know, why do some, some things succeed and why do, why do some things not succeed? And what I liked about this one was, although – uh, you know, we're, I'm still very upset about Google Wave, and I'm fighting it with every tweet I can. Um, what I what I like about this is that he makes the analogy that uh, you know, Chatter, which is Sales again for everybody who's just brand new to this, Salesforce is sort of internal social networking. You do statuses and profiles and groups, and but you do it all within Salesforce, um, and and you know, a lot more to it than that. But and 3D TVs and you know, Chatter is going to survive because Salesforce basically is is running it, and it's part of their platform. In fact, they've embedded it into everything, so it would almost be hard to, harder to pull out than it would just to be keep going. And what he's saying is that 3D TVs will survive because um, even though it's a new technology, and it, it's based on something that people understand. And right, because we go to 3D movies, you go to 3D movies. I know you actually I do. I love 3D movies. I actually don't like 3D movies. I find that the ones that are sort of made made for 3D movies like Avatar or shot 3D, awesome. 3D movies that are washed afterwards and made 3D like, oh, here comes an axe. Whoa. No, those aren't very good. Um, but what he's saying is that 3D TVs, because people already understand the value proposition of 3D. They go to a movie. They pay – you know, here in New York, it's twelve fifty for a movie. It's nineteen fifty if you're going to a three D movie. So we already understand. Okay, there's a. It's it's more valuable. I want it. I I need it. So um. So when you move that from the big cinema down to smaller screen TVs, people are really going to go. Oh, okay, I'll pay for it. And I understand why I'm going to get it. So he's saying Chatter, which is based on sort of social networking and Facebook and statuses, which is easy to understand. Um, unlike Google Wave, which really doesn't have some other piece to it. It doesn't have something you can compare and go, oh, I get that. You could try to compare it to Instant Messenger. That doesn't really work. You can try to compare it to Notes. It doesn't really work. You can try to compare it to email. That doesn't really work. Um, it doesn't really have a really good comparison because it is sort of paradigm breaking. Uh, anyway, I thought it was a good article and uh, hopefully, you know, what were your thoughts on it? Well, I think you, you summed it up rather well uh, <laughs> with your analogy or their analogy of 3D TVs and and them taking that to people know 3D and then saying, well, half of the 
half a billion people know status updates and and you know news streams so they know what this thing is before they get into it uh however scary it might be to open up the kimono if you will at your company and and put a social network out there and google wave is sort of to me it reminds me of the the innovator's dilemma that that book by um his last name is Christensen. I, I can never remember the first name. But when do you know when to do something new and different when uh, something that already exists is working well? And that thing that already exists that's working well is things like email, things like social networking. And Google Wave was Google's attempt, as they always do, to try and do something uh, radical and different. And in this case... Uh, I firmly believe that it worked. It was it was something that changed the game for Arcus and our company and how we communicate and collaborate with each other. But there was no go-to-market strategy. There was no, this is what this is, and this is what you can uh, compare it to because you know this, so now you're going to know this. They couldn't even explain it. They it, they would choke on themselves by saying, it's it's this, it's that, it's this, it's I am, it's chat, it's... It's it's email, it's message board, it's real time, it's social, it's right. You know, so there it's was too much. It, it is a little it is. too much for the, and it's not, the and amateur. It's not well marketed. And I think that's where you know it's it's almost it's actually. I'll make another analogy to uh, HD DVD, HD DVD, and the difference between HD DVD and Blu-ray. Now I could have sworn HD DVD was gonna gonna win because I think it was combining two things that people understand. DVD, which we've had for however many years, 10, 15 years, and HD, high definition. And I thought combining the two, that made anybody who understood the two things could put them together and go, oh, I get it. It's like DVD, but better. Now, Blu-ray, I actually thought was a horrible name for something. It means nothing. It's actually supposed to, I think it's the name of, it's a blue laser that's in the thing that allows it to pack all the data in there. Um, and yet it won. Uh, it won probably because a company was behind it, put millions and millions and millions, probably up into the billions, uh, in advertising of it and pushed it very, very hard. None of that stuff happened with Google Wave, thus why I think it, you know, they had problems with it. Um, you know, just I was actually sitting here thinking, OK, 3D TV, that makes sense, right? It's a three-dimensional television. It's two things you understand. Why not name Google Wave something like Email 2? Yeah, that would have made sense because what they what they thought would work was what worked with Gmail, where they just put it out and and then said, "Oh, this is just a little different user interface on top of something that you already know. It's going to work a little different within the browser, and and it's going to be cool and hip, and you have to have an invite to get in." And I think they thought Google Wave would do the same, uh, but people already knew email, and they just wanted better email. And that's what Gmail gave them. It was email, but better. More storage, better features for free, etc. Wave didn't make that comparison. There was no, uh, like this blog post says, there was nothing to compare it to. There was no 3D television. There was no Facebook to Salesforce's chatter. There was no X to Google's Wave. And that is marketing. That is marketing and brand positioning. That is not reality. Reality is whatever marketing wants to make it you know is 3d tv really 3d i mean yes i guess is blu-ray really blu-ray is nothing but if someone just puts enough units out there and puts enough money sometimes these things take hold i don't feel like google put enough money into it i don't think they put enough advertising i don't think they actually went back and thought thought about it as a product and how we can monetize it I, to, to be exact they never put ads in it right they never put ads in it. They never did any advertising around it. I mean, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing Google App ads or Google Gmail ads. They never did that for Google Wave. So, I mean, again, I think if they had really thought about it, come back to it eat differently, maybe just include it in Gmail, right? Instead of making it a different product, why not just make it like, you know, Google Notes in Gmail? Anyway, so that's um, – that's that is a good article. I think, you know, it's short, sweet, but I think, you know, brings sort of what we're getting into – um, you know, and an interesting, it, it's, I think it's the first time we get to look at something that's kind of not worked in the cloud and that's cool. Cause it's, it, you know, in some ways it proves the theory, right? You have the outliers. Um, all right. So second one, uh, second article was five popular questions on cloud computing. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. There are five and I'm going to, why don't we both, why don't we just split them up and I'll take the first one. You can 
or I'll take the second one. You take the first one, and then we'll go from there. And, um, you know, I think these are, in some ways, they're, they're good questions because for people who don't understand cloud computing, they're kind of openers. So let's start with the first one. I'll ask the question. You give me the answer. How's that? Do I get to ask the second one, and you get to give the answer? Yes. Sweet. Yes. I like Just that. Just because you're the co-host. All right. Um, how do I – so the question number one was – and, again, these were compiled from people at a cloud computing seminar. What was their kind of, like, top questions? Uh Question number one, how do I know where my data is for regulation purposes? You know, I think the answer to this is as simple as you ask. Uh, you know, you, when you sign up with a cloud provider, you can ask them. Uh, you have SLAs in place, obviously, for, uh, for certain pieces that you want protected for your own data. And essentially, you can, you can ask them. You can say, hey, I have this regulatory requirement that that says I'm not allowed to have data outside of this country or et cetera. And, you know, you ask them, where is my data physically being stored? Can I take a tour of your data center, et cetera? And it's pretty much as simple as that. I, I, I'm, I'm sure with some cloud providers, they even publish on their websites where their data centers are located and where your data might be housed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a simple, it is very simple as, you know, Cloud computing does not just mean, oh, it's up in the sky somewhere. They're actually still sitting somewhere. I think the the thing you want to add into that question is where is my data stored and where is the um the backup to that data and where is the hot, you know, the hot swap of it. So where's the disaster recovery on that? So make sure you ask this two parts of it, because where my data is stored, that's kind of that's generic. Go deep and say, where's my production data that I'm hitting every day? And then if that data were to go away, and I know you have backups because you're a cloud you're a good cloud provider now where are those backups and where are that where is that um that data and that dr disaster recovery go ask me the number two sure uh who is responsible for patching virtual servers rented in the cloud yeah so this is kind of interesting because um it does speak to cloud computing because cloud computing is made up of virtualization it's one of the sort of key cornerstones of cloud computing um but in some ways, it's 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 like saying, you know, how much RAM is on the server, or what kind of RAID array, or how fast are the drives. It's it's getting down into it's it's getting too deep into the architectural stack, which we love to talk about, of cloud computing to say, you know what, in a actually in a very good cloud computing service, um, and certainly the ones that we're most familiar with and the ones we talk about the most, you shouldn't care. Um, they're going to do it, right? That's actually what you do. To, that's why you pay them a license. And part of your licensing and part of what you're paying cloud computing provider to do is to make sure you're never thinking about virtual servers and thinking about who's patching them or what, or, or even what operating system they're on. I mean, they, there's some cloud computing companies that you get deeper into the stack, you know, that you can do more. Um, but in some ways, you should be abstracted from that. If you really want the scalability, if you really want the ability to, you know, do what your business does best, you know, asking about virtual server patching is kind of, you know, it's it's almost getting a little too deep. So uh, the, the answer is a cloud computing provider is responsible. Um, but I think you should also redefine what you're using a cloud computing for if, if you're looking at the patching level. Um, so then number three was, how do I know my cloud provider can scale? Am I answering this one? Yes, you are. Okay. So again, I'll, I'll talk to, um, you know, before you sign on, and if you're that large of a company or organization where you need to know that your cloud provider can scale with you, uh, you're going to want to ask them, you know, who are your biggest clients? What are, the, what are the volumes of data that you're handling as far as those largest clients are concerned? Uh, have you ever handled this level of uh, of data volume, do you have high throughput with your API, et cetera? Um, and, and you're going to want to make sure, again, I'll go back to the SLA, that that those types of, of volumes that you yourself are anticipating are brought up up front when you're looking to sign a contract and saying, you know, I'm looking to scale at this rate. You need to scale with me. Sign on, you know, sign on on or sign off on that, that kind of thing. Um, essentially, again, my, my answers are, you really just have to ask. And I think do some homework as the yeah. other one is, you know, make sure that, that uh, you know, I would want to see in a cloud provider a lot of transparency about what's up and what's down. Um, you're finding that more and more cloud providers uh, computing are, are publishing some sort of 
place, uh, whether that be uh, Twitter actually has a page now. Again, again, sort of yeah. social networking. Google um, Google has one for their apps. Salesforce Google has, has one, one for their has entire one. Even Rackspace has one that basically say, "Where if you were having trouble, go here." Um, so I would want to go there, and I'd want to look at look at their sort of history. They should have a history, and you should be able to ask that question of, you know, what is not what is your uptime? Because if anybody doesn't say three nines, is basically they're going to lie because everybody wants to be at three nines, but it's more. And that's you know ninety nine point nine for everybody out out there, um, but basically you want to say you know what's the track record, um, and then again I think it's about being very honest with the provider to say what you want to do with it. If you want to put ten people on a service, and fine. If you if you're if you're putting ten people today and you're putting three hundred three hundred or five thousand tomorrow, and you're not telling them that, then you know that's that's probably where you hit scalability issues. And then ask, you know, ask around because everybody will have a story about what happened with them, um, and then see what the track record, how long they've been in business. That'd be another thing I look for. Okay, uh, all right, you ask me. Oh wait, yeah, ask me the next one. Hey, you just keep answering all the questions. It's good. Uh, it's good. You have well, good answers. Uh, how do I get my data back if my cloud provider goes broke? That's actually a really good question, and is I would I would almost think that one and where is my data? Not for regulatory, but. Who owns my data is probably the number one question. That it's not even in this list. Um, the answer should always be, yeah, uh, you can get it back in a number of different ways. Um, and your your answer should be, you shouldn't be looking, you know, waiting for them to go broke to know that you can get it down. It's like it's like backup. And you and I have talked about backup, you know, offline, not on this podcast. But you know, a, a backup system is only as good as the, your ability to test it. And so while I can think that my data is okay because it's backed up somewhere, if I've never actually tried to get that data back from my backup system, then it's no good because I don't know that I can get it back. Same thing with this. It's like if you're going to wait to the point where it's where the company goes broke to get your data back, yeah, you're, you're not going to do well. How about this? Ask the cloud provider when you start off to say, I want to have some sort of ability to take my data out at any period of time. And how can I do that? And what formats do you give it to me? Do you put it on a disk and ship it to me? Do you put it on a, you know, can I download it? Are they in zip files? How often can I do it? Can it be scheduled so I don't have to remember to do it? Um, ask these questions, and then you should have that ability. So before they, you know, before they go broke, and you should be testing it. You should make sure that you're doing it as part of your normal business cycle. Um, and and then again, a, a company that goes broke generally won't just fall off a cliff. It won't be like Monday, you log in, you're cloud computing, and Tuesday, you log in, it's like company broke. It should be warning signs, and any good company, even when they're going broke, will say, okay, we're going broke, here's your data, come get it, in the normal way that you've been testing over the last, you know, couple months. Um, all right, so number five. I'll, go, I'll ask you, and then we'll both hit it out of the park. Uh, what are the key due diligence points look at when signing a contract with a cloud provider <laughs> it's basically a sum of all yeah you know score. i was just gonna say it sort of sums up all the different topics that we've been talking about you know where is my data stored where is it backed up how how fast if one you know one production environment goes down how fast am i swapped over to the other environment again slas are key right you want to have uh strong slas in place for certain uh, key services that that you're going to have uh, as the as the um, as it relates to the provider, um, you obviously want to know you know as far as scalability is concerned. You know, I'm just sort of reading down these topics. As far as scalability is concerned, can this cloud provider scale with you as you grow, as you grow to number of users, as you grow to um, you know amounts of data that you're putting into a system? Um, have they done it before? Uh, ask around for their top clients. You know, I would even fish around on on the social networks and look for some bad clients, uh, clients who have bad things to say about about the cloud service provider, and see if you can connect with them. Uh, I'm sure that they'd be happy to <laughs> talk to you about their experience with uh, with the provider. Um, you want to look at the different levels of support that they can provide and the different levels of transparency within that support that they can provide. So do they have a, a premier support or a, you know, a, a platinum support that you could go to for your specific needs if you're uh, X size customer versus Y size customer? Um, 
those are the types of points I would look at. I'm sure there are more that you can think of. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I would this is one of the things that night this is going to sound a little bit self-serving but i think you you should really be looking at um you should really be looking at when you're going to a cloud providing service you're probably using someone to help you get there um and and it's those people when you're going and and during that process uh, you know the the companies that can really help you go through these points because again it depends on what you want to do with it, you know, what you're what you're using it for, what your business process you're using it for, and how key that is to your business. You know, is it okay that something goes down for a day or an hour or a second? Um, almost no provider is, you know, 100% uptime. Even some of the best providers still go down unscheduled and go down scheduled. And so, you know, if you're doing call center type stuff, you know, weekend downtime is sometimes no good so how are they going to handle that situation and uh, so i I think it's you know it's a matching up of what you're trying to achieve on your business from your business side to what the cloud provider offers um and then yeah all these questions where's my data how can i back it up uh who owns it what's the contract what's the support level like and what does everybody else in the world say about this provider how long you've been around what's your track record all that kind of stuff um, you know, same questions I think you would ask if you're going to buy a car too, really, you know, how long you've been making cars, how, what's the support level on this car? So, uh, good questions, sort of, uh, very kind of generic. I'm surprised the number one question wasn't, uh, who owns the data? Cause that's usually the number one question. Who owns my data? Um, and the answer is always you, you always own your own data. And if anywhere in the contract, it says you don't own your data, don't sign that contract. Um, you should always own it fully and outright. It should be stored in their services, but you should always own it. All right, so next topic or last topic uh, before we get out of this Monday here is uh, talking about nonprofits. And this one, this one I will hand over to you and before I wrestle <laughs> it back. So, um, you know, this is about, uh, you know, we like to add in a little bit of sort of what we're doing. And we are actually do work with a lot of nonprofits. Um, but, uh, you know, it's how are nonprofits using the cloud and, uh, you actually came from a nonprofit and work with, you know, aren't a lot of the nonprofits that we have as clients. So talk a little bit about nonprofits in the cloud. Yeah. So the cloud is very important to nonprofit success because nonprofits, um, while they do make money and do have budgets and some of them are very, very large, you know, like, uh, Teach for America is a very large organization of, I think, two to three thousand employees so it's you know a pretty decent sized company uh they do need to make you know do more with less and the cloud is sort of the the way for them to be able to uh optimize their processes within the organization without owning a lot of it assets that that aren't really core to their mission it lets them do the things that are core to their mission without you know needing certain expertise levels uh, for IT infrastructure and things of that nature. So some of the things that we've seen nonprofits use the cloud for, um, uh, obviously, number one is is email. Uh, services like Gmail, uh, nonprofits can use for free. Uh, they have an EDU edition. They also have a government edition, uh, both of which can be used for free for nonprofits up to 3,000 users. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal service that Google does there. Um, obviously a lot of nonprofits use Salesforce. Uh, they get 10 free user licenses of Salesforce and are able to do, um, their fundraising, which is, there's a sort of a nonprofit starter pack that comes with a fundraising package. And, um, a lot of nonprofits tend to do, um, you know, recruitment and admissions, volunteer management, um, uh, human capital. So they're, they're tracking, you know, people that they're helping, you know, aiding. Um, a lot of nonprofits do that type of work. So, so they're, they're just, you know, they're just tracking data. And it just makes a whole lot of more sense to track it in the cloud using, you know, something like Salesforce or even Google Apps than it does to track it on an Excel spreadsheet, which a lot of them are are doing, uh, and they don't get the the economies of scale and the and the ability to collaborate with each other when you're doing things on a spreadsheet on a shared drive um, as you would, you know, using Salesforce or Google. Uh, a lot of partners of Google and Salesforce and and uh, among others, they they follow the the uh, model of the foundations that give this stuff away for free so they'll either 
give away their product totally free uh, or discount it heavily uh, for nonprofits. So if you're a nonprofit and you're looking to use, you know, Google or Salesforce or, um, you know, those are the, the two main ones that I've seen used, but there are plenty of other cloud products. Um, you know, look at App Exchange listings and Google Marketplace listings, and most likely they'll say discounted for MPOs or, or um, you know, or NGOs, and that essentially means they're discounting it for nonprofit use. And in some cases, it's completely free, uh, which is free is good. Um, the the thing that you know nonprofits often run into is that they get stuff for free and then they don't use it right. Um, so uh, another self-serving uh, plug is, is companies like, like ourselves, like Argus help nonprofits get the most out of this high-end technology. Right. And, and in some ways we like to say, hey, listen, if you're getting a lot of this stuff for free, you want to pay for some of the, you know, pay the small amount to get to make sure you get set up for yourself because you're right we've seen many clients who just they're coming around their second or third round of geez i have this but no one's adopted it or they're still living in excel spreadsheets and there's all sorts of issues with that um so yeah i i, I agree and, and i think in some ways like nonprofits and, and kind of startups and small businesses there's actually an article, article today about how small businesses are really adopting the cloud much faster than a large enterprise which makes absolute sense it's like it's a no-brainer um but it's both you know it's about the time to market it's about speed it's about you know capital costs and they don't they don't want to spend millions of dollars in hardware just to start you know start the ball rolling so um that's cool um so all right time for the cloud focus app pick of the week we're starting uh, to roll off the tongue it is. It is the cloud focus app pick of the week. Cloud focus app pick of the week. Uh, we're gonna ask you to do a little bit on the speedy side since we're running towards our allotted thirty minutes. So we're gonna try to keep this podcast too. So give me your cloud focus app pick of the week. Sure. Mine is a, a Salesforce app exchange product called Dream Factory Snapshot. It is a, a phenomenal change management tool. It allows you to take a snapshot of any sandbox org and compare it against a snapshot of your production org so if you're making changes in your sandbox environment or your development environment uh, you can look at the differences between that environment and your production environment and then you can actually push those changes from the sandbox to the production environment um, you know this this is a, a great tool for admins who aren't developers who aren't used to using something like eclipse and who don't quite trust the the cloud deploy that Salesforce has just released and, and might still be in beta. Uh, Dream Factory Snapshot's been around for a while and they do a great job at um, you know taking customizations and changes from one place and moving them to another. Where do they store the data while it's going between? Is it on their servers? Yeah, the data's with Dream Factory. It's it's all, all in right. metadata and then it and then it moves over to so that might be something just again if you're if your data I think I find this pretty interesting people get very specific about where the data is when they're talking to the first cloud provider and company like Salesforce uh, you know where is it and what's going to happen but then they'll go take an app exchange product and throw it in there and not realize that their data is going there as well so just always make sure I mean it's a good uh, thing I've never actually used it but we've we've evaluated it in different life in different life um, but uh, you know, always make sure that you understand that if you're installing a third-party application that does something with your data outside of your Salesforce instance, that it possibly you know could be going to there, and then you might want to check up on that. Um, that's a good one. What's the pricing on it? Do you know? It's based on your org, so ah. so it's not it's not it's a based simple on data answer. or users or um, users. Okay, all right. It's not a simple uh, not a simple answer. Yeah, you know, it's it, and I I. Didn't think it would be because most cloud computing um, solutions are based on the per user, which gets kind of weird when you're already paying a per license fee and then a per person license fee, and then they want to add on top, and that's fine for five to ten, twenty, thirty people. But when you get to you know three thousand people, and when you're up there, it, you have a little leverage. It's true. It's true. Um, all right. Well, mine's gonna be the. It is something because we did a we did something last week, and it seems to be in our Twitter stream a lot. So I thought. Uh, not only will I talk about it, but I'll throw in the little the little biscuit that makes it <laughs> cloud computing. So my pick of the week is uh, an application by one of my favorite companies on the planet, um, besides my own, 
uh, called Omni Group. They have been around since the days of Next OS, which is a long, long time ago. They actually were known for building one of the first browsers on the Next platform called uh, Omni Web. Uh, Anyway, they uh, became a big GTD, a getting things done shop. And then three years ago, because one of their products was being heavily used by a set of Apple scripts to do this, they decided it was time to turn it into an actual application, and they created OmniFocus. Uh, OmniFocus is, at the very basis, it's a task management, task and project management. Um, from its simplest basis, you can just have a bunch of lists, and you can just sort through those lists. Uh, if you want to get more advanced, it can do sort of projects, and, and it has a lot of the getting things done or GTD um, methodology built into it about next actions and about, um, about context, about where you do work. There's actually some great documentation on their website, which is at omnigroup.com. Um, slash i'm sure slash uh omnifocus uh they have pdfs they have white papers they have videos really good stuff um uh, well the thing that i actually think it brings into the cloud piece is that they built they have an iphone version um they have they're a mac shop so they're not going to be on anything else but mac but they have an iphone ger- version an ipad version and a mac os version and they all sync uh pretty well actually through mobile me um and they actually have their own cloud their own cloud sync platform as well um and so what's nice is it in some ways it's cloud computing right because my data sits up on the mobile me servers which are apple um which you pay for as a service but they have a again they have a free beta version of theirs which is similar thing and then everything i do here kind of gets synced up there and synced down to my iphone and then synced to my ipad and if i do a task here or add in a bunch of stuff um, it's really a nice application, and you know, you and 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 I, we were talking about it last week, and I know you've become a new, you're a newfound uh, uh, person who's been enjoying the, <laughs> the luxury of of lists and of managing some of your tasks. Um, but it's it's not a cheap app. I'll say nothing by Omni Group is cheap. Their uh, iPhone app, for OmniFocus for the iPhone, is twenty bucks. The iPad is forty bucks, and I think the OmniFocus for the desktop is. 80, 90, something like that, 80 bucks. So it is a lot, but uh, I, I always like to measure what I purchase in sort of time. And if something, if I feel like an application actually helps me more, be more productive, saves me half an hour a day or an hour a day. Well, an hour a day times seven days, you know, seven hours, and that's a lot of time, and what am I willing to pay for that time? So uh, it's OmniFocus by Omni Group uh, with Mobile Me Sync. Uh, for 80 bucks at omnigroup.com. And that is the end of the podcast. Uh, if you want to follow us on any one of our social networking, uh, you know, please go to here on Twitter. We're at three different places. The company, Arcus, is at arcusinc.com, A R K U S I N C, sorry, twitter.com slash arcusinc. I'm at Jason M. Atwood, uh, so twitter.com slash Jason M. Atwood. Justin's at twitter.com slash just edelstein um and then we're on facebook too facebook.com slash arcus inc you can follow us there as well uh we post basically you know news and and things like that the podcasts um there's also blog.arcusinc.com if you want to just if you want to catch up i know justin i've been reading over his next blog post you're not going to want to miss that um it's a really good one um, he's uh, blowing me away. I've got to get going on mine. And uh, if you if you want to subscribe to the podcast, go to iTunes. Um, iTunes, you can you can subscribe, and then it flows down to you through the cloud every day or whenever it's published. It's great stuff. Um, so do that. And if you're there, leave us a review. We actually got a review last week, which is great. Our first review. Thank you very much. I forgot the name of the person. The actually the the. the um, the username of the person, um, but thank you very much for putting that review up there. We love that; it really helps out on the rankings and all that. And just so we know that you really enjoyed the the podcast. Um, so that's it. So thank you for joining us for this Cloud Focus Weekly. And uh, until next week, enjoy those cloudy days.